Good afternoon, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Aquarium of the Pacific's Online Academy. My name is Alicia, and I'm excited to be joining you today. We're going to be talking about one of my favorite animals. We're going to be talking about the octopus today. Now, if you have any questions, you're as excited as I am, you have things to share, uh, you are participating with us and would like to text in, my friend Amanda is going to be putting up our number for us so you can text in, um, or actually I have even... There we go. I have both the number and even our email. So if you'd like to email in, let's say that you are watching this after we've gone live today, you can email it live at lvaop.org. So that number, if you would like to text in, is right there at the bottom. And for our, our kiddos out there, don't forget that you um, should be asking your parents permission and that normal texting rates do apply. All right, so we're going to be exploring a group of animals that I love. They're so fascinating. Now, before we talk about the octopus, I do want to talk about, take a step back and talk about the bigger group of animals that they're part of. And, and it's really fascinating, actually. There, there's some really um, cool uh, critters out there that are part of this group called cephalopods. Now, cephalopods are a type of invertebrate, meaning that they don't have a spine. And cephalopod means a head foot. And they just have a really interesting body type. And so this would include animals such as the cuttlefish, the nautilus, the squid, and our friends, the octopus. And so I wanted to first talk to you a little bit about kind of their, their most ancient relative of this group. And in fact, they've been called living fossils, and that is the chambered nautilus. So here's kind of the cousin to an octopus, but I don't know, looking right now, do you see any similarities to an octopus? Do you see any similar body parts? What is it that this animal, here's the eye right here, and then this is a shell that's around their body. Are there any similar parts to an octopus? looks pretty different, right? And so this animal has been around for millions of years. You can find evidence of the chambered nautilus in our fossil record. So their body plan hasn't changed very much in, in millions of years. So they, they do pretty well with, with their body type. And they're one of the groups in this cephalopod family that still has a shell. And so this is a big difference from the other members of this group. So you'll see, and I'm going to actually take you over to my document camera because, you know, this animal moving around, you have your, your eye here, your shell, and your tentacles. They're very, very different. So as we uh, look at the different members of this cephalopod group, we'll see some similarities here, but this is the most ancient of this group. So I'm going to go over to my document camera. And in the studio today, we have Amanda, who's helping me switch back and forth. And if you're texting in your questions and comments, we have Miss Stacy, who's helping out with that. All right, so I'm going to take a look at the underside. So this is if we were to take that shell and cut it in half so that we can take a look on the inside of the shell. And I, I really wanted to show you this. Now, this is very similar to the mollusks, which is the larger group that they belong to. They're related to snails. Crazy. This is, if you're like, hey, this looks like a shell that I might find at the beach. One, that would be a really cool shell. Two, then you're talking about this larger group called mollusks. So here are the individual chambers that give this animal its name. So the chamber nautilus swims around and it floats using little pockets of air that it traps and can regulate in these little quadrants that it has for its shell. Now, when it first hatches from its tiny little egg, it, its shell is here. And then as it grows, it adds on and becomes bigger and bigger. So the animal is living in these different parts of the shell. And then there are also these chambered pieces that allow it to add or subtract, subtract oxygen that allow this animal to float in the water, which is crazy. Now, if we were to um, just take a peek really quick at another type of nautilus, 
This is the shell to a paper Nautilus. It's very fragile. They also um, have this outside covering to them, but this shell is much lighter. It enables them to swim a little bit more freely in the water. I'm gonna try to very delicately put down the, the shell here. Isn't that beautiful? It even has little ridges along its side to help aid in protection so that animals don't wanna chew through this. So this is, the this is the papered Nautilus because it has a very thin shell, not as sturdy as that chambered Nautilus. Again, the chambered Nautilus is kind of like the, the more ancient body plan. Now moving through a little bit, so we've taken a look at one of its cousins that still has that shell. Let's take a look next at a squid. Now a squid is part of this group and I think um, we can take a look. Now squid can be anything from uh, very, very tiny. We have a picture of our little bobtail squid. <laughs> and you'll see it, its arms and tentacles are hiding in the sand here. This is a, a resting bobtail squid. And the bobtail squid has this, what we call visceral mass, this part right here. Now, uh, let's see, I think I have my plush example. So this is a squid, this is kind of the typical squid example. The body plan is just a little bit more compact for the, the Hawaiian bobtail squid that we're seeing here. But for this whole group of cephalopods, they have their brain in the center. So right around here, they have their eyes and then they have their organs in kind of a mass up here. And the squid typically have some sort of fin at the end. The little bobtail squid here, I think has a little bit of a ridge, but it's tucked in the sand there, trying to hide from predators. This is a, a very small member of this group. And then we'll take a look at some other photographs here in a minute. They have these really long tentacles and arms. And when we start to investigate the octopus, we'll look a little bit closer to some of the differences between what we consider an arm and a tentacle. And what's really interesting too, is that for members of this group, um, how they eat. And so we'll, we'll talk about that as we investigate these arms and tentacles as well. So this is the little bobtail squid, which really cool about this animal is they have on the underside of them, right where their mouth is, they have a little ring, this little pocket where they keep a, a type of bacteria that glows and helps attract their little plankton food for them. Isn't that cool? So they are attracting little tiny organisms in the water by using glowy, glowy bits. All right, <laughs> Kartik asks, um, are octopus and squid in the same family? Yes, that's a great question. So again, the name of this group is called cephalopods. And Miss Santadino's class asks from Arroyo Elementary, does an octopus remember people? And do they know the people who take care of them here at the aquarium? Ooh, those are some great questions. Now, when we're talking about the, 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 all the members of the cephalopod group, scientists do believe that octopuses are very intelligent. They're problem solvers, and they have both short and long-term memory. And so they believe a lot of this developed as they... Um, they have a very different brain than us. They, but they, as they studied the brain, the brain is kind of a donut shape, by the way. Each of these arms has kind of independent movement. And in order to process everything from their environment, they became more and more sophisticated, having kind of like these neural nets that started to cluster around each arm and that talk to each other, right? Their arms have to talk to each other. You wouldn't want one arm going this way and the other arm going this way and then more of them moving in the other direction. And so their brains are very different from ours, but they're pretty sophisticated. And so they're able to problem solve, take in the information around them and, and use that. And there are um, 
octopuses that live here at the aquarium. And we do believe that they, they recognize the people that they interact with, which is incredible because they have that short and long-term memory. It could be as simple as they remember um, people in the blue shirts, take good care of them and give them food. <laughs> but it could be as sophisticated as um, them being able to remember individual people and the faces that for those, the people that take care of them. And they start to become very comfortable with the people that take care of them. So, and, and you know what? The personalities are very different for our octopuses. Some of the octopuses are very playful and curious and really enjoy us interacting with them. Some of them might be a little bit more shy or standoffish. They all have their own personality, which I think is pretty incredible. All right. I did want to show you just a few other members of this group. I think we have um, the cuttlefish is another member of this group. By the way, so we've, we've lost that hard piece, right? So the other members of this group have a shell. The squids still have, that we were talking about before, squids still have kind of what we call a remnant shell, a piece of that shell inside of them, and they call that the pen. And that helps give some stability inside their body. So it runs along the backside of their body. And um, if, you, if you're curious and want to watch one of our previously uh, recorded classes, we do a squid dissection, and you can see that, that pen. Oh, this is our Humboldt squid. So Humboldt squid are very large, and you can see it's, it's bigger than a person, which is pretty incredible. So squid can be as tiny as those little bobtail squid. Probably there are species out there that are even smaller. I don't know if they're more adorable than the bobtail squid. You can tell I have a favorite. Uh, but they can also be as big as Humboldt squid, which we can find off of our California coast. We've even seen sperm whales uh, off of our coast before. We think that they... Uh, will seasonally come by to hunt some of these larger squid species, which is so cool. And then, of course, you may have heard of the giant squid, which is the largest member of this cephalopod group. And it's very hard for us to really study the giant squid because they believe they live very, very deep in the ocean. But they have washed onto shore, ranging anywhere from 30 to 60 feet long. Now, very exciting, we've had recently within the last 10 years or so, a few more attempts at recording giant squid. Uh, sometimes it was by accident, and sometimes we um, have gone down there on purpose. Uh, but they did collect some footage recently. Uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration had recorded, was it NOAA, Stacy, that recorded? Yeah, so we call it NOAA for short, and that is our government agency that um, explores and studies the oceans for us. They sent a, an unmanned vehicle down called a remotely operated vehicle to record and they just so happened to get footage of a giant squid who was investigating the light. I think Miss Amanda has that. Ah, uh, she's looking for it. She's looking for it. <laughs> All right, well, she's, she's looking for the video. We might bring it up a little bit later. So, um, oh, I did want to tell you, so kind of size comparison, right? So we've been talking about the little Nautilus, which you can kind of fit in your, your hand. And that squid can be anywhere from, uh, you know, again, tiny, tiny little fits in your hand to 60 feet long. And then we were talking a little bit about the cuttlefish and cuttlefish are a little bit different and shaped just a little bit different as well. So we'll bring up the, the cuttlefish in just a moment, but I think they found the video for us. It's, it's worth the wait. It's worth the wait. So we'll see if you can pull that up. So think you're on a, you were, we're getting recording. This is a recording that scientists are watching from a vessel and they have light and here comes out of the darkness in the deep ocean, these really big arms. Now that, that wasn't a very long video, but you have to imagine a whole ship full of people probably going, yay! This is a very, very, very rare animal. And the fact that it's alive and not washed up, kind of kind of dead on a beach and gross and in pieces. Uh, but to see one in its natural habitat was amazing. The first time I saw that, it was, uh, I think, made my, um, my hair raise a little bit. It was pretty cool. Did you see that arm come out of 
come out of almost nowhere. <laughs> Pretty incredible. All right, well, we'll go ahead and put up a picture again of that cuttlefish because I wanted to tell you about the last member of this group before we, we kind of dive into the details of the octopus. So we're looking here at a little cuttlefish. Now, growing up, I thought it was cuddle spelt with a D, meaning like you want to give it a cuddle because I think they're so cute. But I, <laughs> as an adult, I realized they're cuttle with a T. Um, and that name comes from, uh, they have a special uh, piece inside of their body called a cuttle bone. And again, like the squid, it gives them a little bit of um, uh, stability in their body because they have no bones, remember? So this internal piece isn't exactly a bone. It's like a leftover shell piece. So again, we're becoming a little bit more sophisticated and the we've lost the shell on the outside, but still have this little bone that runs along the inside of the animal. Look how beautiful this giant cuttlefish is. They get pretty big. They can grow up to 20 inches long and weigh up to 23 pounds, which I think is pretty heavy considering it has no bones. They're a pretty hefty animal. What do you notice that's different between the squid, the cuttlefish, and our nautilus? Here's another view here. Well, you might be noticing they have this fin that runs around their body, kind of like a little skirt. To me, it looks like a little skirt that they're wearing. And the, the way they swim is a little bit different. They kind of move this fin around. And I think we have a video of a cuttlefish moving through the water. Uh, I, the one swimming, on, uh, there we go. So we'll, she's just gonna go ahead and pull that, see if I can answer some questions as we, as we wait here. Uh, Gage asks, can a giant Pacific octopus fight another octopus? Sure. I'm sure if there was uh, food and one animal wanted the other, they would probably fight over the food. But they, you know, a lot of the animals that we're talking about here, the octopuses, they like to stay separate. They like their own little areas, their own little burrows. They don't really socialize too much together. So if you visited our aquarium and you're like, hey, there's only one octopus in there. Does it need a companion? The answer is no. <laughs> they are happy with their own territory, their own little cave, and um, they uh, would probably battle over their food a little bit. So yes, they can probably fight it out if there is food or a resource that they wanted. Oh, okay, so Amanda has that swimming video, which is so cool. So I just wanted to show you it, uh, the octopus in motion. Yay! Look at it using that fin all the way around its mantle so that, again, this part here, this, this part around our cuttlefish and our squid, and when we look at the octopus, that is called the mantle. And it has, again, it's kind of a different shape than we are with our organs, would be like our organs up here, our head, and our brain, and then all of our arms and or tentacles on the other side. Julian and Liam asked, what is the lifespan of a squid? So um, for most squid, the average is between 12 and 18 months. That's a year to a year and a half. They grow really fast and uh, their lifespans, you know, for a lot of it, they're tiny. They have to grow really quickly in order to get big enough to find their food and not be food themselves. Off of our coast, we have uh, like a common squid that gets to be about this big and they're food for a lot of animals. It's a lot of quick moving protein <laughs> in the food web. So they, they reproduce and they make lots and lots of babies to help replace all of the, the animals that are kind of eaten throughout their ecosystem. So they have a, a real fast life cycle. And then uh, Stacy added a little note for me here, which is nice. It says that evidence suggests that uh, f there might be five years as a lifespan for a giant squid, which makes sense. You, you know, thinking about growing to be 30 or 40 feet long, or maybe even 60 feet long, it's going to take more than a year. That's a, that's a very fast growing organism. All right. <laughs> we have a lot of, uh, teachers who are joining us and I, I love that. Uh, sent Donato, uh, Leach, Miss Castillo, and Miss 
McHugh's, cla McHugh's classes want to know how long do octopuses live? That is an excellent question. And, you know, most average anywhere from three to five years. Again, there are many different kinds of octopuses. Uh, generally, though, there are, <laughs> generally, though, uh, it just depends on the type of octopus. Some only live a year to a year and a half. I know for some of the little cuttlefish that we have here at the aquarium, um, they have a, a pretty short lifespan. So they have lots of babies and they reproduce very quickly, uh, but they only live maybe one or two years, which is pretty incredible. I think for our giant Pacific octopus, um, it does surprise a lot of people because this is a, an animal that has a personality and you know problem solves that they you know don't live very long, sometimes anywhere from that two to five years. And so it can be um, kind of hard for the people that take care of them. They get to really know them and know their personality and they, they're just here for a, a, tiny, a tiny bit with us. We have to enjoy them while we can. Uh, sure, well, let's, let's take a pause and, and start talking about the, the adaptations for our octopus. So uh, Miss Amanda just put our two spot octopus behind us. Uh, maybe we'll, we'll take a, a, a look so we were talking about arms, and I was saying that, you know, the arms of an octopus are pretty incredible. So let's take a look here. What do you notice on the arms of the octopus? What are these things called? If you know, go ahead and you can text those in. Maybe Miss Amanda can put up that, that question, the number for you again. And if you want, how many do you think of these little circular things do you think an octopus has? Now, we also, I think, have a clip to show you. So we call these arms. The octopus has eight arms, but their cousins in this group have not only arms, but they also have tentacles, these, these pieces that are a little bit longer. I think we have a comparison between the arms and... Here we go. There's an arm, and there is a tentacle. What do you notice? What's different? Are they the same? Yeah, you've probably noticed that these things that I'm asking you the name for, <laughs> if you think you know, um, are all the way to the end, or almost to the end of the arm on an, an octopus or a squid. And for a tentacle, they just have them at the very, very end. Now, an octopus has eight arms. It doesn't have any tentacles. Their cousins, though, the squid and the cuttlefish, do have these eight arms, plus they have their tentacles. All right, did you guess what these things are called? Are you shouting them out? Are you texting them in? Oh, Kartik says tentacles. So yeah, these are tentacles here. And the things that are on the tentacles, these little circles, those are called suction cups. Isn't that cool? Who did? Drake. Good job, Drake. And I'm sure there are many others that are probably trying to <laughs> think of it fast or message fast. And it's okay if you don't have an option to text, um, you know, shouting it out or telling your friends, your family. Here is the giant Pacific octopus showing off its beautiful suction cups. And for each of those arms, they can have an average of 250 of these suction cups. And they're very strong on the giant Pacific octopus. So, you know, they don't have any bones, but they still need to grab their prey. And they do eat anything from fish to crabs to shrimp. And grabbing their prey with these suction cups is really helpful. So it's kind of like a plunger, the end of a plunger. Uh, you might have one in here. I can take a look in a little bit. So if you were to to think about a suction cup, that's kind of how they're, they're sticking on. So the, it's, it pushes the water and creates kind of a vacuum and sticks. And some of these animals, like the giant squid, on the end of their tentacles, they have a ring of teeth inside their suction cups. Isn't that crazy? I think that's really crazy. Let's take a look. I think we have a video of a cuttlefish using its tentacles. So its arms are kind of hovered Oh, wow, did you see that? What just shot out there were the, the feeding tentacles. So a cuttlefish hunts a little bit different than an octopus and will keep 
keep its arms kind of hanging there, and then it has those feeding tentacles ready to grab. Pretty amazing. You're probably also seeing color changes that are happening, which is another really cool adaptation. So again, an octopus has eight arms. Oh, the other thing, they're kind of like superheroes, right? They have all of these cool things that they do. Those suction cups taste. They can taste with those suction cups, which is incredible. They can taste the water. They don't have tongues like us, but they still need information from their environment. And so it's like a, a taste bud receiver. Taste and smell are pretty similar in the water. Basically, they're detecting chemicals that could give them hints about the world around them. And so that is something I think is really cool. Now we were watching swimming happening. So another adaptation for an octopus and some of these other animals is jet propulsion. I think we have a little video to show you. So water goes into their mantle and they can squeeze it out of that smaller piece right down here called a siphon. And I think we have video of the giant Pacific octopus using its siphon. So again, it's sucking it in, and then out of that smaller piece, it's pushing out and forcing water through that siphon. And we can bring up the, the octopus here. So here's that siphon. What's also happening is water is then going through and passing over its gills to breathe. And then it has its three hearts to help it move all of that oxygen that it just took out of the water through its body. All right, so how many suction cups on an octopus arm? And so, yeah, uh, Stacy wrote down here, because of the, the 250 average, some of them even have up to 2,200 suction cups. Uh, so that was from Gianna. And then we also have a question from Gianna. How big are the suction cups on the giant squid? So the biggest ones are anywhere from um, like an inch to two inches. So, and that's circumference, so that's around. And remember that they also have a ring of teeth, teeth on the inside. That's how they first knew that there was a giant, uh, giant squid down in the depths of the ocean. Not necessarily because they were uh, seeing the, the giant squid because their predator, which was the sperm whale, had rings, these curious rings and teeth marks after diving down and hunting some of these bigger squid. They were also finding one of the few hard pieces inside of an octopus. So remember we were talking about kind of those hard parts on the cousins, like the, the shell from the chambered nautilus, the pen from the squid, and that cuddle bone from the cuttlefish. Well, an octopus doesn't have any leftover shell pieces. The only hard part left to it is part of its mouth called a beak. And it is really crazy. So I had mentioned that they eat some of those hard shelled items and they use their suction cups to grab their prey. Um, and for cuttlefish, they use the, the tentacles, the feeding tentacles to shoot out. Well, that feeding part is called a beak and it's really hard. And because they're invertebrates and they don't, and the, and the octopus has no bones inside of it, anything that the beak can fit through, that, um, that octopus can fit through, which is crazy. Now, I have an example uh, I'm going to show it a little higher so you can kind of see it with the blue behind. So I think you can kind of see it. It's in a little case. Um, I wish I could open the case, but I don't think I can open the case. <laughs> but I wanted to show you. I think this is from a Humboldt squid. So it's a little bit bigger. But this beak is very hard. And here's that Humboldt squid. So it's a, it's a big animal. And a lot... So squids and, and, and cuttlefish and the um, octopus all have this beak underneath. Now what's really interesting is that the octopuses that we've been talking about um, have a, many of them have a neurotoxin. Not only can they bite, but they also quickly have a toxin that they release to immobilize or, or make the animal stop moving. So if you're trying to battle it out, with a crab, let's say, that's your prey. You want the crab to stop pinching because the crab can pinch off one of your arms. <laughs> that wouldn't be very nice. So they 
bite, they release that neurotoxin, and it makes the animal become um, still. So I think that that's really cool. They have so many adaptations that help them in their, their habitat. What am I forgetting? Oh, the last one I want to talk about is camouflage. We have to talk about camouflage. Now I think we have, oh yeah, this really cool video. Wait for it. So this, this octopus says, oh, I am going to hide and I'm not only going to change my colors in parts of a second. Did you see that? It's still doing it. But I'm also going to change how bumpy or smooth my skin is. So watch for the texture change. That's awesome. How do they do that? Well, they have really special muscles on the top parts, the top layer of skin around their body. And underneath their skin, they have cells filled with color. And they're able to either close up or expand those color packets. So they either make the color packets, these are called chromatophores, look bigger or smaller. This is very zoomed into a squid, but you can see those cells kind of opening and closing. And so they're, they are able to manipulate how much of those colors we see and also the texture of their body. They are truly the masters of camouflage, in my opinion. I think they're so cool. Now, we have a couple more questions here, and I, uh, I'll ask Amanda to maybe put up the, the video that we, were, um, that we had ready for the little red octopus playing, so that uh, while, we while I answer some of these questions here, uh, we can video. This is a red octopus. This is an octopus that we have here at the aquarium, and we've <laughs> given it this little puzzle that it very quickly opened. So this box was closed. This is our aquarist, JJ. She's showing us that she's put a piece of shrimp in here, and she's going to invite our red octopus to come play. And the octopus already has seen JJ, very excited. <laughs> you can see it puts its arm over the side. It's tasting the water and said, yes, yes, I would love to play. I'm going to come in. I can smell and I know that there, there is food in here for me to try to get. And this helps stimulate the octopus's brain, make sure that there's something cool for it to think about, kind of a nice game for it. All right, so we have lots of questions coming in. So Cupcake asks, are squid harmful to people? You know, for the, for the most part, I would say because we're not in their environments, uh, you know, there's not a lot of people encountering squid. Now, we had that picture of a Humboldt squid. I think that if you were to threaten the Humboldt squid because of its size and its beak, it might try to defend itself a little bit. It does have that beak. But I wouldn't say that these animals will um, come after people. Also, when we're thinking about the cephalopods, and we're thinking about uh, just the, the adaptations they have, including that neurotoxin. You know, sometimes um, there have been cases of people picking up an octopus in like a tide pool and then being bitten by the octopus and the person not knowing that it has a venom to it, that toxin. And that can make someone very sick, like the blue ringed octopus. Again, it's a good lesson that, you know, in nature, if you, if you don't know, you know, if you're not maybe a scientist, um, you're not a, a professional studying the animal, it's probably best not to touch the wildlife, just using our eyes to make observations. And a lot of that helps make sure that we're safe and the animals are safe. Some other questions here. How many species of cephalopods are there? There's over 800. Over 800 to discover. <laughs> I hope you look up some species after our class today. I'm always learning about new animals. This is one of the reasons I love my job. I'm always learning new fun facts. And the fact that there's over 800 to learn is pretty exciting. Do squid camouflage? Well, we we're just actually looking at the skin, the outside covering of the cephalopod, or sorry, the, um, the squid here. And so they do have the ability to change color and to become lighter or darker in their habitat. Now, because squid are a little bit more open ocean, they're not 
trying to hide along you know, a rock or a coral, I would say that their colors are not as bright and vibrant as an octopus is. And um, the last message here is to say happy birthday to Amanda. It is Amanda's birthday, the one who's been operating today. So happy birthday, Amanda. <laughs> We're excited to have you joining us today. We have our whole online academy to help us celebrate. <laughs> All right, so we have talked a whole lot about octopus adaptations, but we've also talked about kind of that larger group of animals. And so I hope that you are inspired to continue to explore these really, really cool critters. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining me. And thanks to Amanda and Stacy, and happy birthday, Amanda. Thank you, everyone. See you tomorrow. <laughs>